I suggest we will give it two more minutes or something for a few more people to join in. Is it okay? Yeah, so, good suggestion. Mm -hmm. Good. So, so. Just, I will just. Uh, Hello, Eva. How are you? Um. Was muted. Yeah. Fine, and you? Nice to see you. Um, yes, yeah, same here. It's good. It's been really nice seeing after a long time. Yeah. Even right. for the Michael. <laughs> that's really true. <laughs> yeah. How are how are things? But you are calling from you are from India, right? From how is that's how true. is the pandemic in India now? What is the situation? Oh. Uh, uh, it's now in under control condition, but in April it was terrible. I must say oh. that. Oh yeah. Yeah, the new variant came in and it just blew, it was blown everything. So now yes, it's under control condition and it's consistently decreasing. Okay, very so that's good. a good part. And in yeah, our yeah. in our state, everyone has. Uh, now having 100% first dose of vaccination has been done. Really? Okay, but in uh, which state second, are, are you from? Yes. Which which state? I'm from Uttarakhand. From Uttarakhand. I'm from Uttarakhand. Okay. It's the northern. Right, yeah. right. Dehradun. So. Right. That's true. <laughs> right. Perfect. Yes. So the the hilly area. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Last nice. time I had been to the Tiger Reserve is, uh, near Dehradun, yeah, so beautiful. Oh, oh yeah. yes, it must be near to Nenital. That's right, yeah, yeah. So the, and the and the, the rivers are so clear up there, really. It's wonderful water to see. Yeah, it. Corbett. <laughs> right. Yeah, you must have been to Corbett. Yeah, there is a lot, high diversity when it comes to flora and fauna both that's right that's right yeah okay so we are yes. a few more people have joined in now should we should we take off or yes maybe you can ease us into the program michael yes. as others find their way <laughs> okay good yeah so a very good afternoon to Asia and a very good afternoon or early evening to Oceania. So welcome to this live session, Capacities for Forest Science, Shape Your Professional Future. So on behalf of the SBDC team, on behalf of Janice, Joanna, Eva, of course, I would like to welcome you all to this SBDC session for Asia and Oceania. It is a session uh, where we would like to present a little bit the work of the special program for development of capacities. And, uh, but also would like to discuss with you somehow about the future of training of capacity development, what is needed to be a forest scientist and an impact for, for a scientist in Asia and the Pacific region. Please note that this session will be recorded. So for the purposes of um, report writing and also documentation. As you have seen from the program, the objective of this session is first of all to learn about the capacity development opportunities offered by U4SPDC 
what we offer to for the scientists. In this particular case, in our UFO World Day for the Asian and Oceania time zone for Asian and Oceanian scientists. That you may also make contacts to expand your network for professional development. You can see who else is in the meeting and reflecting on learning priorities, particular priorities to expand skills, knowledge and capacities for forest scientists. Well, and we have uh, put together a small program and have later then in our session also the opportunity to discuss this in small groups. So your views and your reflections and of course the needs you find important actually in your area of work uh, to bring to the table. So maybe that also SPDC can adjust and maybe add other training courses on other topics and specific training um, opportunities for the benefits, of course, of our scientists within the UFRO network and associated networks. As a start, I would like to um, present very briefly about UFRO SPDC. And for that, I would like to share my screen. Um, and show you a short presentation about the special program for development of capacities. Can you see the screen? I think everybody, yeah. Yes. Good. Um, from the very beginning of SPDC in 1983, actually, the objective of the program has been to expand and foster forest research capacity in economic disadvantaged countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. So it was always UFRO's intention to support the science community to be active members of UFRO. And later on, as we can later and then see also, it became much more a capacity development program rather than a simple support program to join UFRO meetings. I've just put together in a nutshell, a little bit the history of SPDC started in 1983, based on a decision by the UFRO Congress in 1981, which they identified that support to economically disadvantaged regions and that UFRO would need to do something to support that program as that this part of the community uh, were not so able actually financially actually to join this voluntary network. So it was established in 1983 and there had been the major program was the so-called scientist assistance program providing travel support for scientists to join UFRO meetings. And then this was consolidated in the period 91 to 2001 where some training workshops were added to the program um, in order to support skills needed by forest scientists to do better science uh, in their own area. You can see then that we have an expansion of the program starting from the 2000s onwards, still maintaining this SAP, the scientist assistance program, but we added to the program the pre-Congress training uh, and we added also new modules uh, for skills for photo scientists, which I a little bit later will explain what these additional um, topics and uh, skills are. And then since the world has moved on, you know, and the globalization has taken um, really a an, an, an high level of integration between different regions and economic development and so on, the term developing countries did not apply anymore. So we decided to change the name uh, from developing country to the special program for development of capacities, which is actually exactly what the program is doing and it re reflects much better uh, our mission and our work. Okay, we were lucky to maintain the acronym SPDC because this you will never get rid of. You know, uh, once it is called SPDC, it's called SPDC forever. So we somehow, uh, massaged the phrases to get this somehow accommodated and to reflect our mission. And in that expansion number two, since roughly 2013, 
we have added to the training workshops and the scientist assistance program in the so-called Young Scientist Initiative. I explain a bit later to this and even thematic networking to train and to um, practice networking among scientists on very specific topics and including getting things uh, done in countries where then um, a kind of science practice interaction scientists uh, work with practitioners to get really good land management and in this case also forest landscape restoration on the ground. So this is a very brief history and of course we we are the oldest program of UFRO and of course we hope it will remain like this. Just to give you a context of programs and projects in the context of the overall UFRO network and I think in other sessions you have heard already about uh, UFRO a lot now as the voluntary network of scientists. They are collaborating on a voluntary basis in division research groups, working party and task forces. They are very specific theme and topic specific working parties, but also the interdisciplinary task forces. And you can imagine, and I think you are part of it. This is really this scientific knowledge and expertise, a huge body of the global expertise in forest and tree related research uh, is what actually is at our hand because all those divisions, research groups, task forces are connected. And the program, programs and projects are now actually trying to utilize that knowledge and put it into policy support, in information management, as well as in capacity building. So these programs and projects of UFRO utilizing the network in terms of capacity development, it is the trainers of UFRO SPDC, like we are fortunate to have Anders Daraband with us today, who is one of those scientists, but giving a helping hand to SPDC to do training workshops. So we are directly actually employing or subcontracting this to the scientists to, to help in our capacity development. Policy support, and you have seen the science policy sessions today and uh, yesterday in the other time zones, GFEP and WFSC are programs bringing in the knowledge from the network into their programs. And this is overall international <coughs> forest related, <coughs> sorry, forest related activities of UFRO. So this is the context in which our programs and projects are working. Now coming to the SPDC capacity development concept, uh, which we have developed over the years. It's rather simple. You know, in the core of that chart, you can see research capacities. A scientist needs skills and abilities to produce good research results. First of all, to write proposals so that they get the money for the, uh, for the research, to convincing research proposals, good structure in terms of objectives, material and methods, and so on. But other research capacities are scientific methods to calculate the data, to get the statistics right, to do good literature review. These are all skills needed for research capacities. But what are good research results if you shelve them in your cupboard and nobody's looking at them? So they will have no impact. So therefore, in addition to doing good research, and quality research, you need capacities for interaction with societies. You need to make sure the research results are getting out to the society, to the policymaker, to the land manager, to the local communities, to the journalists, and to very different audiences. But for that, we need also skills. So therefore, we have other training workshops and training programs where we offer these kind of capacities for interaction with society. And this we put into training workshop, networking projects, of course, mainly addressing in individuals. But you can imagine if these individuals then are working in their own institution and having better skills, this will also contribute to improving the abilities and the skills and the, the capacities of these institutions, mainly our UFRO members. 
I just show you know a few examples of of uh, these programs under SPDC here, the Scientist Assistance Program, uh, where we mainly uh, support scientists and of course always early and mid career scientists uh, to go to UFRO meetings. And there are seventy UFRO meetings worldwide in average every year, and since many years we can support roughly 100 scientists per year um, to go to UFRO meetings, travel intercontinental or even within the continent. So we have very different uh, travel arrangements, but of course we need to raise the funds for it, which uh, is always convincing the donor that's not just a science tourism, but it's really capacity development to make connections, to learn from others and to go to these meetings. Then, as I said before, we have in the core of our business is the scientific competence, writing proposals, research methods. Um, there are other training modules on systematic review to do a good evaluation of existing science, put it into perspective for your research project, that you don't duplication, that you really start from where the scientific knowledge is now and you progress and you add value and new insights and innovation into that research field. So this is the scientific competence is different workshops. And as I said already, I explained the interaction with society. And of course, here we started with working effectively at the interface of forest science and forest policy based on results of a task force, which actually in the early 2000s worked out a certain uh, guideline how to do good science policy interaction. Then there was a working party on communicating forest research and that making science work for policy and management. We have two handbooks on that and we also teaching or we having offering these time kind of trainings in communicating forest research. In our African meeting, we heard also that it's very important the target audiences, yeah, and we probably need to be much, much more specific in, in designing training workshops for different audiences and how to communicate with them. Yeah. So um, with social media and with the different information needs, um, deep knowledge to very, very, let me call it superficial one, yeah, just to get an idea that people for policy making and so on, or for for more for more detailed knowledge, which we have to communicate. Well, and then in the last expansion, uh, about ten years ago, we started with these thematic networking projects where we brought scientists together to produce together scientific analysis. Here, for example, on forest landscape restoration, we did this already starting in two thousand thirteen in Africa, under an ITTO project. Then later on, uh, funding with the German Ministry of Environment for Asia, Latin America, and a very big one in 2019 for the Congress uh, for having nine countries and 17 landscapes um, uh, evaluated. A global study on teak and our collaboration now in country, not only in Malawi, but also in Sri Lanka, where we try actually, and this we will hear today by Andras about that training module actually to um, address the issues of facilitating forest landscape restoration on the ground. We do this also in Latin America. Our main partner is Katia in Costa Rica as a network of scientific institutions and countries in Central and South America. And these courses are all in Spanish, by the way, we are trying, of course, as you, you, uh, you for is a is a is a multilingual network to have our training modules, of course, in English, then in French and Spanish. But we have also expanded now, um, getting training mat material in local languages like Chicheva in Malawi, as well as Tamil and Sinhala in Sri Lanka. Yeah, and. Recently, we were somehow forced to go to online training workshops. And one of our flagship online trainings is the systematic evidence evaluation by our colleagues in Oxford. Um, it's a very inclusive uh, mode of, uh, of training because many people can join in uh, from all sorts of corners of the world. And um, 
We have developed these kind of uh, online trainings uh, and probably in future we will also go for much more hybrid uh, trainings, having these several weeks of online sessions then followed by a physical meeting, which we think can be very effective. Well, and the trainings associated with the UFO World Congresses became a very famous feature of the Congress starting in 2005 in Brisbane, to Seoul in 2010, 2014 in Utah in the United States, and now recently in Brazil, in Curitiba, the so-called pre-Congress trainings where 75 people, uh, participants joined in four different concurrently running training workshops. This were really an, uh, yeah, a hype, a hype week, I must say, yeah, with a lot of um, um, connecting people um, and networking. And it was not just the training workshops per se, but it was the interaction over coffee break, over lunch, over dinner and so on, really to connect people for, for their future uh, careers. And of course, we need also to, to advertise our, our training or get the work of you throughout. And therefore we have a collaboration with the Global Landscapes Forum and here the Global Landscapes Forum chapter Lilongwe Malawi on training on FLR facilitators. More um, Anders will show also in his presentation. Well, and with this, uh, I want to close my short presentation on SPDC, we are part of the UFRO family. And of course, I hope you connect with each other and you have the different social media and um, channels here shown. Uh, you're probably very well um, acquainted with these. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention about SPDC. Well, I stop my screen now. And now from the overview of what SPDC can offer, we for that particular session in Asia and Oceania, we picked now two perspectives. And this is very important. One perspective is from a trainer side. And uh, we are fortunate to, to, to have Andras Daraband with us, one of our uh, trainers and one of our um, uh, teachers in in several of the, the, the trainings. And we decided to look into the forest landscape restoration training module, which we offer now. And we have offered this in several countries and several regions already uh, to show you what kind of training actually we offer. Andras is a scientist from Hungary with a lot of Austrian connection, if I may say so. And um, he has a lot of professional experience in the interface of land use and forest use. Uh, biodiversity conservation, climate change, particularly in the development cooperation context. And as you know that land use is a complex uh, mix of so many different things actually, from ecology to socioeconomic and, and, um, uh, and technical things. Uh, he's the right person to be part of our SPDC training on forest landscape restoration. And with this, Let's listen to him from the teacher's perspective or the um, yeah, trainer's perspective of, of SPDC. So for that, thank you, Andras, for joining and the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael, and welcome, uh, dear participants. Um, just a second. Can you... Can you see my screen? Uh, no, not yet. Not yet, okay. Mm -hmm. I can see it, but uh, just a second. Let me try again. Yes, otherwise just give me a cue. I have everything prepared. Is there anything visible? No. Okay. Should I jump in and? 
maybe it seems yes. the trick you showed me it doesn't work <laughs> all right yeah now it should be visible right just a second yeah. um, yeah having some trouble with my computer it won't let me out of um, the powerpoint presentation mode i'm just alt and tap yeah should switch the win windows back to zoom hopefully <laughs> yeah okay so welcome everyone and uh, thank you michael for the introduction once again um as as mentioned by michael uh, I would like to give you some insights on, on our series of uh, trainings uh, on practical capacities for forest landscape restoration facilitators. That uh, uh, these trainings were a series of trainings organized uh, by UFRO SBDC. Uh, could we move to the next, please? Um, so what, what is this uh, training about? It's basically um, very strongly practice-oriented training uh, that aims to capacitate facilitators with the various methods and tools uh, they need to implement forest landscape restoration. Uh, the trainings build on, on, um, on, a, on a long, vast expertise, I, I should say, uh, that was presented by Michael focusing on um, passing science policy, interfacing skills, uh, skills on, on communicating forest science, as well as um, the various trainings that we held on forest landscape restoration facilitation, inc including in the UFRO World Congress in Curitiba, to various teams uh, and, and um, stakeholders in Malawi, Sri Lanka, and various uh, Pacific Island nations. Uh, the, the training str is strongly oriented along um, the UFRO Practical Forest Landscape Restoration Guidebook, so that uh, we, have, we basically have a, a ready-made uh, reference material for, for the training so that participants can easily uh, read up uh, on certain aspects that are uh, being delivered in the training. Uh, in addition, the training contents also build on the uh, snapshot study conducted by UFRO across the world on implementing forest landscape restoration on the ground. Um, and on the training materials that uh, UFRO together with ITTO developed on the same topic. Um, and of course, uh, given the, the different uh, geographies and target groups of, of these trainings, uh, the contents are always adjusted to the target audience. Um, may I ask for the next slide, please? So who are those uh, FLR facilitators whom, whom we are training in through this um, series of, of training workshops? Um, they already mentioned a um, global snapshot study on, on implementing forest landscape restoration uh, conducted by UFRO, identify, synthesized um, uh, the practical implications of forest landscape restoration along three operating spaces. On the one hand, we have the governance space actors um, acting on, on, on policies and, and, uh, and governance issues. On the other hand, we have the field implementation where, where restoration takes place on the ground. And in between these two operating spaces, we have the FLR facilitation operating space. And obviously the, the people who operate in this um, third operating space, which is basically wedged in between the other two, are, are the people we call forest landscape restoration facilitators. They are basically the, the engines of the entire process um, who need to have a holistic understanding of forest landscape restoration, including its principles, uh, tools, and the processes applied. 
And of course, they need uh, to have uh, specialized skills, including on how to bring this uh, broad range of actors who, who are part of the arena together under a common understanding. May I ask you for the next slide? Um, so the question you may ask now, are these skills of any use? And um, if you look at um, the, the various um, global programs on focusing on, on restoration, the Bonn Challenge, uh, and including its regional offsprings, um, as well as, as uh, various global processes that uh, answer, that provide answers or search for answers to global, uh, various aspects of global change. Restoration and also uh, specifically forest restoration is always part of these answers, including on climate change, biodiversity loss, land degradation, and uh, uh, socioeconomic co-benefits that are documented in the Paris Agreement, in the post-2020 biodiversity agenda, uh, land degradation neutrality targets, and the sustainable development goals respectively. Uh, you would certainly also have uh, heard a lot on the UN decade of on, on ecosystem restoration that has started, that has been kickstarted recently. So uh, restoration and forest lands landscape restoration receives a lot of emphasis and attention. In addition to that, very large areas across the globe are potentially available for restoration. But it is uh, it is the role of of uh, those people with the with the right um, skills and knowledge to identify which uh, one of those areas are in reality available for restoration. That, that vast potential really melts down to a much smaller. Uh, area, to much smaller areas where forest landscape restoration can be implemented. Despite all this, um, you know, verbal uh, priority and, and, and uh, the priority allotted to restoration and forest landscape restoration in the global development agenda, restoration is still frequently pursued along sectoral silos. And uh, those specialized skills to facilitate forest landscape restoration processes that um, that are cognizant of the of the landscape uh, approach and its principles are really scarce. Uh, may I ask you for the next, please? So, if you ask uh, yourself the question whether those skills are um, useful, the answer is clearly yes. Uh, now, you may ask another question uh, to yourself. Would, should you be interested in enrolling? So what you would get uh, out of uh, this training program is a holistic understanding of uh, complex land use issues and their relation to forest landscape restoration. Basically, how forest landscape restoration processes can be uh, inserted into complex uh, social environmental systems uh, for achieving positive change. Um, you would learn uh, associated um, specialized skills, knowledge, processes and tools, and how to practically implement them on the ground. Uh, and of course, you would uh, be part of a, of a network of, of fellow practitioners of forest landscape restoration, and you would have access to mentoring uh, by UFRO as a result of uh, your participation. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I would like to hand the word back to Michael. Well, thank you very much, Andras. Excellent. Uh, because you, ha you have seen now that Andras and uh, together with other trainers, uh, other scientists in the UFRO network, and some practitioners actually is designing and, uh, and delivering a training, which is more or less at the science practice interface. Yeah? That means we all wish that the scientific knowledge we have, we generate has an impact. And I think you all know that many of those uh, good science and also leading to good options actually of, of good land management or non-degrading land management should be implemented uh, in the field. But how to do that means to have an impact. 
And this is kind of transferring knowledge. And in this case, the FLR facilitators. So they would be change agents on the ground and many of the scientists would definitely be in a good position to train them, to mentor them and to join them in their efforts in the field. So this is a bridge between science and practice in a country or uh, at the local level. And here actually, we are very grateful to have opportunities and thank you Andres for, <clears throat> for showing us that kind of training actually, which on both sides train scientists as well as practitioners in implementing forest landscape restoration. Well, thanks a lot, Anders. And this is, was now the, from the training point of view. Now let's go to the other side, to the perspective of an SBDC participant. And I'm very happy that Gurvina Aurora is with us. Uh, she wants to tell us about the experience of an SBDC program participant. And um, uh, Gurvin, you, have been, you are the carbon monitoring consultant and an ecosystem service improvement project. And you are working with ICFRE. This is the Council uh, of Forestry Research and Education, the forestry education and science uh, umbrella network in India. So a very important and impactful organization. Um, and you are also a coordinator or the um, um, a deputy coordinator of working party ecology and silviculture of pine in division one in Ufro. And uh, we are very keen to hear your perspective from a participant's point of view of an SPDC program. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. Uh, uh, welcome everyone. Um, uh, please. I am Dr. Gurveen Arora from India and uh, I have got, I will basically be talking about uh, the explicit three linkages, which is related most, uh, very important for you for SPDC and for us, that is network expansion, professional growth and high skill. Next please. Um, uh, actually, this is a win-win approach for all of us who had, an opportunity to be a part of this workshop and conference from 29th September to 5th, 26th September to 5th October in 2019 in Curitiba, Brazil. Uh, the fellowship which I got, uh, I was able to learn about forest landscape restoration. I was part of this uh, group and it has provided me an uh, insightful strengthening of vision and context and global context of forest landscape restoration and hence its solution. It has also uh, given us uh, successful case studies in terms of successful implementation of uh, uh, meeting those, meeting the targets of mitigation and adaptation and further contributing to the environmental commitments. It, is, uh, also, it has also provided us some strategic points so that we can apply from those real life case studies, which we have experienced, we have taken from our five mentors, that is John, Pramod, Andrews, Steve, and Ernst Foley, and last but not the least, Michael, who joined and has given various information on forest landscape restoration. This workshop has made us familiar with the science policy interface, various tools, and last, the group work, which was our last day. And we have presented our group work and it was very comfortable and it was a very enriching, learning, enriching experience for us because it has not only told about the potential benefits of restoration, which is needed to, which, which is needed to be identified, communicated so that the decision makers, the local communities and societies can be benefited at large at a sustainable level. Next step, please. Next slide. Next slide, please. Should already and, be, right? Okay, thank you. Uh, then I would also like to talk about the networking expansion which we had at a new place, Kuritiba, because uh, coming from India, it is almost around two and a half to three days of traveling to Brazil and who doesn't want to go to Brazil? You know, it's a, 
lifetime experience for a forestry person to see the rainforests of Brazil. So it, I would like to say that, yes, there were a lot of advantages that not about just the learning experience we had, it was about the networking we had in a global context, meeting new people, having a varied level of expo exposure, giving an empowering experience to us so that we can shape up the forest science when we come back to our own place. It has also provided an opportunity to engage with the high level discussions with our academic heroes, which we have always listened. But now we, we were having a great interaction, as Michael said, during the lunch breaks, during the dinner breaks, during coffee breaks. So it was a very learning, a very good learning experience for us. Not only this, but it, they have also uh, uh, told us about uh, not just the advantages, but what all precautions we need to take when we are going for shaping our forest science for our future. So it was a good synergizing experience between people like us on early starters and the experienced people at, at a common place. Next, please. So undoubtedly that has given us skill. It has it, uh, given us a feedback. I was there in a poster presentation. So it, for me, it was uh, very insightful because that if, because of the feedback I received uh, from my early version of latest research work. So it has improved both my presentation and the communication skill. It has made me learn the advancements, advancements in terms of methodology, in terms of evidence-based knowledges. Because in conference, in this Congress, we had some beautiful presentations with the evidences. So we uh, learned the, not only how to study, but how to present your study as well. So it has made us learn what all challenges, the upcoming challenges, what are the consequences and what can be the possible solutions. So this is the most important part that people do talk about the challenges, but very rare we get to know about the solution. So UFRO SPDC is, uh, has provided me and a holistic approach as a big umbrella where I could join and uh, I could talk, uh, I could get the solutions for a different kind of methodologies if I have to study and what can be the consequences and how I should proceed, what should be my approach altogether. Next, please. So I would like to talk that how it has helped me for my present and it is going to help it going to help me in future so coming back i uh, because of that group work it uh, it has helped me to have a good teamwork coordination a good planning and conducting capacity building programs in terms of red plus and giving more knowledge based products moreover it has also helped me in analyzing my scientific data the information in terms of mitigation actions what can be the consequences what can be the gaps uh, financial technical or uh, capacity building gaps uh, uh, which are actually required uh, in terms of uh, forestry sector and climate change in india and the most important part it has incubated in me is that i should con I am going on a right path and I should conduct an advanced research in terms of forest-based mitigation activities and climate change so that I could implement more of a red plus work, more of a forest landscape restoration work. So this uh, workshop come Congress has encouraged me that I am on a right path. I am having a good approach. I should improve my approach so that I can reach to people. I could, uh, help people more and encourage them to practice this. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this, actually, these are the photographs which talks about uh, the networking, the skill we attained, especially in terms of uh, uh, the virtual meeting we had last year of uh, U4SPDC. 
So this is kind of a very collective experience I have got, and I'm continuing undergoing. And I would like to thank um, Eva, uh, Judith, Sylvia, Janice, Iona, Teresa, Jens, Phil, Sustro. Because of them, I've got an exposure and got a correct exposure at a correct time. This is actually very important when any research works, research, scientific research should take is taking place. So I would like to say that it was my first international experience, but it was a great experience. This workshop has brought a new approach to understand forestry science by synthesizing knowledge, by facilitating the relationship with people, communicating effectively by addressing the relevant research based questions and further propagating it to the other people so that they can be encouraged. So thank you, Euphra SPDC, for giving me a wonderful experience and wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, thank you very much. Shukriya to you for this very nice presentation um, because uh, it's so important that we always see how actually these programs actually are received by, by our participants and what they take from these. And I think you have really nicely shown that it was not just technical skills, so, but there was many, many uh, other aspects which you could take for your work and also emulate things at home and try them out or adapt them to the situation in your country and in your cultural environment. So I think therefore um, it's very good to see actually that these kind of gatherings and these kind of events actually have an, have an impact. So, and of course, and I'm sure um, with the enthusiasm you has actually also presented, I'm sure that you will carry the message from these workshops also through, throughout India and sitting right on the top in this ICFRE uh, environment, actually you have a lot of opportunity here uh, to make an impact in your own country. And I think we should all make impact on our own countries and try of course our best actually to carry this forward. Okay, thank you very much for that. But in the same spirit, dear colleagues actually, uh, that we learn from each other, we would like to, to implement a small group work now because we would like to, um, and the, particularly the SPDC team would like to know a little bit uh, in shaping the program also for the future of SPDC, what are now priorities? What are skills and things we, you would need and think, wow, here SPDC could make a difference and could even um, help further developing uh, these, uh, these, yeah, these areas of skills uh, <clears throat> and knowledge. And for that, um, we would like to, to discuss with you in groups. And of course, we, we know that there are different types of skills. And, and let me just put them into two categories. One would be generic skills, such as the ability to work in groups. So the ability to communicate, writing, oral, nonverbal, interaction with society, leadership, creativity. Um, so these are generic skills, also systematic literature review, scientific methods across scientific fields. Doesn't matter whether you're in medical science, in biological science, whether you're in social science or economics, you always need these skills to come up with very good research results and bring these research results to society. Specific skills we would define as specific to forest and tree related research, forest economics, forest fire management, urban forestry, forest landscape restoration, which in itself are already quite complex issues requiring a lot of specific knowledge, forest genetic resources, sustainable forest management, wood technology, diseases, pests, forest soils, and so on. So we would like now that, and we would um, uh, put you into randomly assembled groups. We will probably have five, five groups now with the uh, number of participants. Um, and we would like that you discuss in the group from your perspective, what would be important skills and important gaps you would like to fill uh, where SPDC could help. So 
maybe in your groups, we recommend that you just choose quickly a reporter, somebody who later on in the plenary afterwards would uh, summarize the results of your group work, um, maybe divided into generic and, and more specific skills. Um, and um, you could also uh, write this either in, in, uh, in, in a small document or, or just put them on screen or just verbally present this to us. We will record these things. Um, there is also a Google document available um, where you could actually enter these things. Um, and we would have this short group discussion for about 15 minutes, like to ask uh, Maximilian then to um, divide these into the groups, the participants, and then we reassemble after 15 minutes and then have a final plenary discussion and see what the groups have, uh, have been um, developing and more or less uh, unearthed uh, from, from, the, from the experiences of the different regions. So I would like to hand over to Max Miller and to put the, these groups and then you just start working don't worry if an SPDC team member will join in. We are just listening. We are just trying, but, but you are the main actors in the next 15 minutes uh, to bring your experience on board. Yes, Thank so you. we have three groups, um, three and four people in each group. And uh, you have the Google Docs link in the chat. The chat will go with you to the breakout session so you don't lose the link. And then I would uh, like to send you off. Have fun and um, yeah, a lot of success. Uh, Michael, I didn't move you into any specific group, but your co-host and you can jump. Yeah, fine. Thanks. Because I and, think uh, this is I, only dis disturbing. Yeah. And <laughs> if, now I get the hang of who's in the uh, um, UFLO core team. So I tried to split up everyone into perfect. the different groups. So they are... Super, super. Now this is excellent because they are really nicely distributed. Excellent. Yes. Uh, I've just seen in the last room somebody left now. <laughs> so there are only two people now. Okay, no problem. But that's yeah. a problem. You know, I move them to the rooms and then somebody quits the sessions and, you know. <laughs> yeah, this, this can happen. But we have quite some, some. Uh, yeah, this is one, two, and then we have here three, four, five, six. Yeah, yeah. yeah we used I... to have uh, four, three, 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 and now somebody left in room four. Right. Um, I guess if we somehow at at I don't know eleven twenty five no or eleven I uh, sorry eleven thirty five no yeah so somehow in about reassemble I think then then we should be fine no yeah so thirteen minutes roughly yeah exactly okay, okay good yeah then I should take a short break yes I'll, yeah. I'll also get a coffee if i don't get any do help that, calls do that, from... please because you are you are continuously working so okay see you just then. just as you are <laughs> no, well you are you're doing more at the moment <laughs>
from me.
<clears throat> well, very good. So slowly our colleagues emerging from the groups back to the plenary. Excellent. So once everybody is back, we will discuss now the various input from the groups. I think, Max, I think everybody is back. Is this yes, correct? Yes, this is good. Correct. Perfect. So this is the, the starting point of our final plenary, small plenary session. And uh, we have seen already in the Google Doc, you meant there's quite some, some rich uh, material from the discussion. And uh, may I ask group one, the presenter, just briefly highlight what were the major results of your group discussion. Who would like to, to present this briefly? Um, hello, Michael. I, we are from group one and uh, I would like to present uh, Please. Uh, on behalf of group, group one. We have uh, identified certain uh, skills uh, in terms of generic and specific skills that we do have, but we need to take out the complete utilization of those skills. Like uh, I was talking to Jan, she said that we need to have patience and understanding uh, in terms of uh, you know diversity, having a, a good background diversity. Like people are from NGO background, people are from local community background, people are researchers. To bring their, them on the same panel and listen them, understand them patiently, that brings out a solution in itself. So that skill is actually required. Then even we also discussed that uh, we need to channelize the energy in a right direction. There are few people who are good at writing, good at uh, implementing, and then good at generating ideas. So we need to team them, all of all them, and SPDs, you for SPDs, you can help uh, as we can always look up to an organization who is ready to give us a scientific uh, uh, solution uh, plus financial solution. If we write a good proposal, then it can give us a good funding as well, as uh, we know already. So give us a good exposure that to come to a correct approach so that it can percolate and have a top-down approach and vice versa to get a good uh, implementation of the skills which are there but to identify them and get out a proper use of that for the country's benefit or at large a global benefit. Good, right. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely a very, very important part. These uh, let me say, getting, understanding the cultural diversity, because, you know, at the global level, so many things are being discussed at the global level, but they can only be achieved is all the local solutions are materializing and there must be local solutions and only in adding them up will later on lead to global solutions. Yeah? So, I mean, therefore, these kind of uh, local solutions and the cultural diversity in that context yeah, needs to be negotiated, needs to be developed and so on. So very important. So let us see what we could do actually in terms of training also, um, which is a very context specific, but um, very important point. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I would like to add here one more point is that this diversity can bring us a lot of advantages. If I talk about, especially if you're talking of the local solutions, these are the most sustainable and less, uh, more impactful and require less finance. If we, uh, if we just uh, give time to study each and every country, we will come out with the uh, you know, local solutions, which are actually more worthy. So I guess uh, the training should be on that as well, that how we can, you know, uh, having with the same uh, climate and the same uh, similar other uh, inputs, uh, we can use it in other countries so that right. it can give a sustainable result. Perfect. Very good. 
Nicely put. Thanks a lot, uh, Gravin, for, for that insight for your group. Now we go over to group number two and see who would like to briefly, just briefly highlight the result of the discussion, please. Who is group two? Hi, uh, I'm Suping, okay. First Research Institute Malaysia. I'll be presenting for group two. Very good, thanks. So uh, the general skills that uh, we discuss about are related to networking, speaking up and starting connections. Uh, learn technical skills that can be applied to the research area. Uh, learning how to write uh, a good research paper. Uh, diplomacy skills as well are very important. Uh, learning to make uh, skill, decision-making skills. Uh, challenges include uh, no choice to select courses in university. Okay, and uh, the other one is um, to, to learn overall skills uh, needed for research, uh, especially for fresh graduates or early career scientists uh, to be able to learn these uh, research skills from senior researchers and from peers. Um, for the specific skills, um, the main challenges, uh, the main challenge is uh, identification. Uh, for based on my experience, because uh, I'm a forest entomologist, I uh, have difficulties in insect identification because uh, generally we lack uh, taxonomies uh, in Malaysia. Mm. That's all for, from group two. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. I mean, this is definitely an, a rich discussion you had. Um, if I start from the, from the other end, the, the, the taxonomy for insects and tropical forest is a huge field, but as uh, you are lacking these uh, identifiers, the same will be for tree species. You know, the, the, the problem in many of the, the countries in tropical regions is that the tree identifiers and tree species identifiers are actually you know, they are slowly retiring and all those knowledge accumulated is then gone. And of course, I, I know that, that you at FRIM as well as FRC and also at the Sarawak Forest Department do a lot, at least to, 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 um, to keep these skills also in, in terms of, of identifying species in all sorts, entomology and, and, uh, and, um, and plants. But of course, the... the um, Diplomatic skills, I think it's a very important aspect. Um, mm -hmm. Here I would comment that uh, to be diplomatic, but still keeping to the truth, you know, this is, I think, the art on one hand to convey these messages, what the data show and what the research results show. But we all know the research results do not always show favorable pictures of something that has been done. Yeah? So one needs also to diplomatically chip in where improvements are needed, what needs to be done or what has not been done needs to be um, improved and so on. So really, uh, these are um, can be quite difficult discussions, you know, with, uh, with industry, with policymakers and so on, who have quite some, some other uh, ideas sometimes how to use the land and how to manage the land. But thank you very much, uh, uh, Ping, for that very concise presentation. Now we move over to group number three. Who would like to, to elude us a little bit on the discussions there? Uh, I think uh, the group three was us. I, I wasn't meant to be the, the moderator, but then I ended up being it. Um, so the natural think... moderator. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry for that. Um, uh, we have uh, discussed, uh, and this, the contributions are not from me because you know I was trying to not to influence the the Good. contents. Um, but uh, what we we got out of the discussion is basically um, networking skills and opportunities. So both opportunities for meeting uh, other scientists uh, who are part of. Uh, working on the same topic, but also teaching skills how to do effective and efficient networking. So these two items were highlighted. 
uh, by, by both participants uh, quite, quite strongly. Uh, skills on scientific writing uh, also was mentioned. Uh, also grant proposal writing was the priority. Um, exposure or, or, or trainings on, on the use of latest uh, technologies in, in forestry, primarily focusing on, on inventory forest mensuration, uh, so remote um, technologies, uh, drones and, and, and LIDAR and others. Uh, general awareness raising on, on forest landscape restoration, this was mentioned by uh, Mr. Fola Babalola from, from Nigeria. So he mentioned that there, uh, the awareness on, on forest landscape restoration is very limited. So probably before teaching uh, in-depth uh, specialized training, a, a general sensitization uh, of people would be uh, necessary. Uh, from Dr. Tiwari from India, we heard uh, in addition to the networking skills, uh, skills in, in leadership. So basically a, a, a training on what is leadership, what makes up leadership uh, uh, in, in forest landscape restoration and, and uh, how to particularly how to motivate uh, stakeholders. Uh, and in addition to that, communication skills for particularly for junior scientists, early career scientists, and uh, in-depth um, um, capacity development on the process of forest landscape restoration, both for at the, at the implementation level as well as at the governance level, so that these could be tailor-made to different audiences. Uh, and, and adjust it to, to their particular requirements. And he mentioned that in, in India, um, there is probably not much need in, in, in uh, capacity development on technical skills and knowledge because, because uh, the already existing systems are very strong and, and uh, he, there, is, there may not be much that, that uh, uh, outsiders or the UFRO network could bring in, but he, he said that the focus should rather be on those uh, soft skills or generic skills. I think that's that's it. Thank in brief. You. Yeah, <clears throat> Andra, thank you very much. On behalf of Group Three, yeah, of course, the networking skills, of course, is an is a field where we need to think how best actually to hands on to try this and and uh, a little bit networking project. We of course we are doing already. Um, but of course, interesting was also your point on teaching skills, you know, a little bit the same with mentorship, you know, how actually to, to bring earlier early career scientists more uh, even into this teaching arena that they are good lectures, impactful lectures so that, uh, that students and, and, and those trainees uh, can actually learn from the, the knowledge presented from the, from, from the type of lectures. Uh, and of course here definitely one could uh, design something. Um, of course, the, the world is moving also in terms of technology and, and uh, to bring in some of the new LiDAR and, and even drone-based uh, stuff for, for forest assessment and so on. Definitely very interesting points. Good. Well, let's move to group number four, who would like to, to inform the audience about the discussions there. Okay, good afternoon. Actually, I'm the lone participant in the group, and I was assisted by Miss Eva. Thank you, Miss Eva. Okay, very uh, good. For, for, uh, for my presentation, so I identified uh, one of the cons uh, constraints in our uh, profession. Like, number one is, I think this was also mentioned by the other group, like communication skills, both oral and uh, written. Oral, when it comes to presentation, like uh, although we are well versed in our local dialects, but when it comes to scientific gatherings, you have to present like the result of your study. So uh, that's number one also. And uh, 
one thing also as a researcher, you need to publish your work so that it can be disseminated to other uh, professionals and you can uh, share your outputs or results. And also, uh, what else? Uh, I've also identified here uh, because my field is more on carbon or GHG inventory, uh, we have some limitations when it comes to advances uh, on, in technologies. Like if we want to uh, conduct an in-depth study on like life cycle assessment, we need models or programs so that we can really cover or uh, get uh, uh, authentic data or a good data from the field because it covers a lot of uh, components because it like from grave to from cradle to grave so along the value chain of a certain commodity or products so that one also and uh, one thing also is on the application of information technologies like GIS, like GIS one problem is in purchasing a program which costs you a lot and it keeps on um, uh, advancing the technology. So we cannot uh, catch up the, the new one. So that's one thing also. And also there's also a problem on uh, how to organize or analyze voluminous data. So we need such kind of uh, knowledge, uh, training for us uh, researchers. So right. I think that's all. Excellent, very good. Oh, thank so this you. Was, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Lynn, for, for this um, uh, actually insight in your discussions. And I think these are Again, very, very important aspects actually you have actually unearthed here. Um, connected with communication is definitely what you mentioned, the presentation skills, you know, and to analyze the target audience, to whom to present, yeah, and what to present in terms of selecting and synthesizing things which are important for these audiences. So if these audience is very diverse, of course, probably one is always at the losing end, but if one can actually um, focus this on something most of those people would like to hear, at least in terms of the, in terms of the type of content, I think one has already um, made a big step forward in communicating properly the results of, of the research work and the, the possible options for, for, for solutions. Of course, I mean that, in connection with the greenhouse gas inventories and this life cycle uh, analysis, of course, this is a wide field. It's on the, as you rightly mentioned, I mean, obviously sometimes or not more often than not, the, the, the data are missing or the real good data actually, and the quality of the data, of course, is another important issue. But here definitely um, one could also um, uh, have uh, capacity development in, in how to circumvent some of these problems and have good uh, ways of actually analyzing as well as also using and creating good data. Um, well, any, any other comments you would like to make on this range of issues which we have just heard from the four groups? Just raise your hand or, or if you would like to add something or any of those priorities. Yes, there's uh, Ian Cole, please. Hello, Michael. Um, my boss and the regards, Arthur and Robert Hong from FRC. Oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, one of the things I would like to pick up was when you mentioned mentorship. Um, I mean, we can have a lot of training courses, um, et cetera, et cetera. But I find that I found my personal experience is like it's great to have mentorship um, because there are times after training, um, certain trainings are not catered maybe for different countries, right? It might be the same system, but we have to readapt to the local to the local scenario. 
So when we have mentors who would actually discuss with us and then point out what other things that we should look at, and it actually makes it more effective in applying the system locally. So um, because personally, I have benefited from the mentorship of um, Colin Maycock who was with us for four years. Uh, Dr. Colin Maycock, he was right. with us for four years in the center. So basically he trained up our team. So to look at things critically, to be able to accept when people point out that like what you say, certain thing needs to be pointed out is the truth. You really have to accept it. So I think mentorship is one of the things that I felt is currently lacking in a lot of scenarios because when we have presentation, I don't think it should be, we, we can ask questions, but questions should be diplomatic to build up instead of to kind of like talk, tear the whole research apart because it's, I don't think it's very good for the early career scientists to have that as well. Um, so that's why I think emphasis should also be on mentorship as well. That's my comment. Well, yeah, but thank you very much. I think this is an excellent um, point you make here um, that this kind of translating, eh, whatever research results are there from um, examples or from other countries and actually to translating this into something locally needed and what people can use actually, that kind of, of um, transition and this kind of path to the practical implementation is so important. Uh, Initially, SPDC has a little bit started with mentorship program in Malawi and Sri Lanka, where actually local mentors, you know, who are from the cultural content, speak the local language, know the problems in the field, know the sensitivities between different stakeholder groups and so on, um, is, is so important. And, and here to where you could help, no? so that, that these mentors are then actually really, of course, they take their initiatives and know what best is actually how to communicate things um, to, to field staff, to land managers, but also to policy makers. Yeah? And, uh, and of course, um, we take this that the mentorship, and I think this came in various groups, the mentorship as, a, as skills and how to arrange these things is, is very, very important to make science work no? and scientific results work also in, in different contexts. Um, just to, uh, to, to, to give this an, an, an example, the, the so-called low impact logging in tropical forest is a thing which has been developed in the 1980s, 90s already. But look at where that kind of environmentally sound and careful logging is being implemented. There are many barriers to it. And still uh, many people in uh, Southeast Asia, in, in the Pacific Islands are struggling with this kind of damages because of, of uh, unsustainable and uncareful and not careful logging operations. And we have to do restoration work afterwards to repair what has been damaged. So I think here mentorship as well as um, uh, other ways of transferring good practices to the field are very, very important. Well, colleagues, I knew it. I knew it. This will be a very, very productive session. And I'm very much excited to have met you again, although unfortunately only virtually, but I, I promise that we will meet in person at some point once actually the pandemic is, is uh, subsiding gradually and we can meet again. So there are no very important things to be said now. I really would like at the top of the hour close now according to our program and for, first of all of course I would like to thank all the participants for all their input and uh, it was really very good to see that uh, really spoke openly about things and please convey the messages also to your colleagues uh, and encourage them to to join um, events of SBDC in the future of course thank you to the speakers yeah, for, for their input, for their insights from the trainer perspective and also participants perspective. Thanks a lot for the technical support, uh, Maximilian, for, for your so, so able uh, managing us technically in the background. Of course, many thanks to my SPDC team, to Janice, to Eva, to uh, Joanna, and also to Daniel for, for supporting and shaping that program 
and the other colleagues from UFRO headquarters reporting now, hopefully on tweeting and uh, Instagramming and whatever is possible uh, from this session. So to all of you, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to Asia, Oceania, and uh, hopefully we meet very soon. And with this, I would like to close this session. All the best and uh, stay safe. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, bye. All the best. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. All the best. Thank you. Bye bye. Where are we supposed to go? <laughs> Thank Just you, everyone, leave. once again. Bye, Bye. Gravine. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Max. Bye. <laughs>